Welcome to Senior Living Investment with Emily Bow. Today, I'm excited to welcome Lauren Jacobs to the show. Lauren is an experienced entrepreneur with a passion for senior living. He is currently the owner operator alongside with his partners of 10 assisted living and memory care facilities in Wisconsin. Lauren brings a wealth of real estate experience to the table, having acquired close to 1,000 doors of multifamily units through syndication deals. He is also a fifth generation real estate investor. Lauren, welcome to the show. Emily, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Very excited to be here. Thank you. First of all, I would like to ask, can you share with us a bit about your background? What led you to invest in senior living facilities? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll try to make this brief, give you the short version, but it all started quite a few years back. As you mentioned, I'm a fifth generation real estate professional now. So I've had a lot of fortunate, been able to been around a lot of people that inspired me to enter the real estate space. So I'm very fortunate that I've had experience and exposure to a lot of different sides of real estate from being an agent and running a brokerage to being behind the property management curtains all the way over onto the investment side of things. And, and so that's really where it all started is the, the interest in real estate. And pretty quickly, I figured out that I was not interested in becoming an agent or running a brokerage. I was very interested in the investment side of real estate and even parts of the property management side of real estate it really fascinated me. So fast forward a few years into my upbringing, I was able to acquire my first single family rental with some help, of course. I was in high school. So I, I've got a taste from a pretty young age of, of kind of operating and being responsible for an investment property. And through college and after graduating, you know, way kind of picked it right back up. Some fix and flips, got some more single family rentals, grew into some commercial retail and office small spaces and things like that. And right around the time we were, my wife got pregnant to have our first son. We often really thought about what does our life look like? What, is, what do we want our future to look like? What are we doing today to make sure that we're going to give this, you know, our, our first child the best possible life? And we realized that at the time I had a W-2, came out of school, went into stem cell research and, and some other things that were fun and rewarding, but, you know, weren't the thing that we wanted to do forever. They, they didn't have the impact that we wanted to be able to have across time and, and industries and space. So we landed on real estate. We said, hey, we really love this real estate stuff. It's, it's going really well, but we need to go bigger and we need to go faster if we want this to be the thing. So dove back into all the books, all the podcasts, all the resources we could get our hands on, went to a bunch of seminars and a ton of phenomenal people along the way, learned a lot and continued to work really hard and as much as I could, as quickly as I could. I didn't have a huge balance sheet at the time. I didn't have a ton of liquidity or a huge Rolodex of high net worth investors that I knew. So really the way that I could add value to a team and get myself into a larger commercial real estate project or a syndication was through, you know, finding deals and, and underwriting deals. So I got really good at underwriting deals or I, I tried, I practiced a lot, I should, I should say, and I offered you know, after underwriting hundreds of deals, most of them as practice, I went out to all the operators I could find and I could network with, and I offered to underwrite their deals for them for free. I said, Hey, you send me your deal. I'll underwrite it for free. I'll give you the feedback. We'll, we'll review it. All I ask is that if you go under contract on this deal, if you move forward to closing, give me an opportunity to earn a spot on that GP team. And that, that's how I got my foot in the door on my first couple syndication opportunities, multifamily syndication opportunities. And from there, I was able to dive in, learn even more, you know, really see behind the curtains, some experience in due diligence, closing, asset management, working with lenders, uh, working with investors. And it you know, really just kind of flourished into ultimately us creating our own investment firm. And I think we're at 13 syndications later. Ever since that second or third syndication, we've been the primary sponsor. And our mission is ultimately to change as many lives for the better as we can. And you have a lot of control in being able to do that when you have a lot of control over where someone lays their head down at night. Offering clean, comfortable, safe living environments that offer opportunity to people is, is really 
what drives us and it's really exciting. To answer your question, what got us into the senior living space, that was a bit of an overview on how we got into the multifamily syndication space. And into the senior living about two, three years ago, we really saw the writing on the wall. 2021 especially, it was just got so hot, overheated and saturated in the multifamily space. We said, you know, this is craziness. We're not gonna go put some uncapped short-term bridge debt on a four cap. Uh, so we decided to look at alternative asset classes and there's a lot of good asset classes out there, but you know, our story at the time, storage, parks, mobile home parks, a lot of other asset classes are starting to become institutionalized, consolidated and overheated as well. Even car washes. I mean, we looked at car washes pretty hard for a while and finally we landed on, we landed on senior living for a couple of reasons. One, we knew a senior living operator was very successful in their place, in their space. And we were very fortunate to be able to shadow, follow along, learn, and you know, kind of work alongside them for quite a while. Um, two, there's a really, there, there's a moat around senior living that exists less so around other asset classes. And what I mean by that is there's a barrier to entry. With most commercial real estate asset classes, you're buying the real estate, right? And the real estate is what, what really drives the value of a property. And it's the same in senior living too. And there's a business component to commercial real estate and all, and in most, if not all asset classes, but the ability to learn, to operate most of those businesses that are layered over the commercial real estate is I can take you a lifetime or a decade to, to figure it out, right? In a lot of the instances, you can figure it out pretty quickly. In senior living, that's not the case. In senior living, it may take a lifetime uh, or certainly years and years and years to become an expert in operating in that space. You're operating a healthcare business on top of multifamily commercial real estate is, is really what it is. And so that barrier to entry makes it much more difficult for people to enter the space, which is going to keep it much less saturated for a longer time. Um, nothing against multifamily. We love multifamily. We still look at multifamily, but to operate a multifamily complex is, is not very difficult. You might have a handful at most of staff. And if one or two of those staff turns over or just walks off in you know, the day of closing, no big deal. You'll find somebody else probably the next day or certainly within the next week. In assisted living, you may acquire 125 bed community and you might have 130 healthcare staff. <laughs> and if some of those people, I mean, if even a handful of them don't show up the next day, that's a huge problem. So you've, you've got a massive barrier to entry, which is good and bad. So anyways, I'll, I'll cut it off there, but that's the probably the middle length version of how we got into senior living and, and a couple of the reasons of why we love it. I definitely see that senior living compared to multifamily is a higher bar to entry because it is require more human touches and uh, more labor involved. And it seems to me that the key for this to success is really an experienced operator. And then how did you find the operator? And also, I also want to connect to the beginning of your story. When you get into real estate investment, you dove into all these podcasts and books, and then you build your knowledge. Now, looking back, do you think the who is more important or the knowledge is more important for a beginner investor? So two crashes here. <laughs> Very good question. I'll take those in order. Uh, the first question is how did we overcome the barrier to entry the yeah. obstacle to get into the senior living space? One, our, our knowledge as an operator or an asset manager of senior living was massively fast tracked because we found the who. We found a mentor who was willing to take us as a mentee and show us the way who was already very successful in the space. So that that's one. Number two, we still made a ton of mistakes. Key of, a piece of advice to anybody who is aspiring to get into the assisted living space, the people are the most important part of the business. You're without 
in high quality staff, you will never have a high quality facility and you will never offer a quality care. And so you will never drive quality high paying residents where staff is the key. And we didn't understand that, or at least we didn't appreciate that, the gravity of that at first. And so finding the right leader, finding the right person to put the, the helm of the ship is, is the most important thing you can do. Somebody who exemplifies the culture that you want to instill at a community, at a facility, and then they their help, you can start bringing in the right people to put in place under them and, and down and down it goes. But it, if you don't have the right person at the helm, you, I mean, you're, you're just destined for mediocrity or worse, right? And as far as performance of a facility. And so that's really the answer. The second half of the answer is that we found the right person to put at the helm who was ready and willing to jump into that role, who has years and years and years of nursing and clinical experience and experience running assisted living and memory care facilities and communities, and who really shares our our vision, our mission, our founding principles. So it, it, we just got very fortunate to find that person at the right time and you know, able to act them to a spot where they can flourish and excel and you know, just build a win-win business. So th those are the biggest things. You need the, absolutely, you need that person. We tried to rely on a third party property manager in the senior living space, and it, it is such a hard space to be successful in. The good third party property managers are going to charge a lot. They're worth it. They're going to charge a lot, but they're going to charge so much that it's hard to maintain that yield, right? It's hard to maintain yield after their fees and they're going to want some upside. They're going to want some equity. The really good operators out there are going to want equity and they're going to charge a lot. So that what we ended up doing is we brought that operations piece in house after we had some less than ideal experiences with third party managers. And that's who we found the right person who I was just mentioning to lead that operations arm across our portfolio. And the second question, if I were to go back and you would again, what would I do differently? Or what would my advice be to coming investors? I don't know that I would do it any differently. I think I would do it mostly the same. The knowledge is very important, but the network is the most important. The people you know, the people you meet, the rooms that you get into to meet the right people and make the right connections. That is the most important piece. Yes, you need to have enough. You need to have a strong enough foundation of knowledge to be able to go in those rooms and sound like you know what you're talking about. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, the people, if I were to do anything differently again, I, I would probably focus a lot more on getting into more rooms with more people so I can make more connections. And, you know, you're one connection away from everything that, you know, you've dreamed of and are setting out to do. Never stop learning. Always, always keep learning and growing and getting better, but also never stop networking. Keep, keep meeting all the, all the people. And you go into a relationship and you're genuine about serving first, and adding value first, pretty incredible things can happen. You're serving without the expectation of receiving anything in return. But <clears throat> it's really what how I entered this space is I, I networked with a lot of operators and I just sought to serve, 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 help, 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 underwrite, underwrite, underwrite deals for them. And were happy to give me a, a little helping hand when, when I was able to help them get what they needed and wanted. So it's, uh, yeah, that would be my advice. Thank you. I definitely see the humility in you. I, I think if we build our reputation out and people tend to look for the horse first rather than the jerky and the way that you serve others and you always put yourself in front of the operators and bring them value first and that's how they identify the person and they see that, yes, I want we want to work with Lauren and that's how things will come after that. It's been a fun journey. We've met a lot of really amazing people. And as much as we are excited to serve all of those people that we meet, we're also very happy to take some time. And on, on most deals we do, you know, we like to give somebody an opportunity, right? That we, we've been, I've received so much help, so many helping hands and, and, you know, 
so much opportunity from folks. I, I love to pay that forward. So on, on most deals that we do, we'll offer somebody who is an aspiring investor or aspiring to get into the space of an opportunity to be a, a small piece of an active role in an opportunity. And sometimes it goes phenomenally. And for some of those folks, we've partnered with them on every deal since. And for others, it's a one and done and you wish them luck in the future. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree. It's, that's, that's what it's all about. It's a people business. Yes, it is. Thank you. So you and your partner currently own and operate 10 assist living and memory care facilities in Wisconsin. Can you walk us through the process of acquiring the, these facilities and the key factors that you consider when making such investments? Yeah, I mean, that's a loaded question. We could have probably several podcast episodes on this one question, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> So it's not so different from multifamily space or really any kind of real estate investing. The first thing you need to do is you need to define your buy box. You know, what am I looking for? Right. And then I need to go out and get those types of deals coming across my desk. And there's a couple different ways we can do that. You can reach out to brokers. You can reach out to wholesalers. You can reach out to uh, owners, procure a list, build a list, design a campaign to go directly to owners. Uh, ultimately, you need to just you just need to aggregate deal flow. Once we get that deal flow, then we get into our underwriting. And again, we you need to build. And what are your criteria? How? What are your protocols or procedures for? How are you going to underwrite deals? I mm -hmm. like to underwrite everything in a very similar way at first. So we're comparing apples to apples. And when we get deeper into our underwriting, we can maybe account for some nuances in, in business plans or, or this or that. Um, but at first I'd like to com compare everything apples to apples. So, and then at the end of our underwriting, we have these key metrics that we want to hit as far as investor returns or returns to ourselves, all, all the metrics that we want to hit. And so if a deal passes through all those checkpoints at that point, now, now it's a real conversation. Now we'll get back on the horn with the owner or the broker or whoever we procured the opportunity from, we'll start negotiating, LOIs go out, agree on an LOI, PSA, redline the PSA, get that signed, diligence, line up lenders, raising capital, closing, and away we go. So it's it's really like the bones of it are not that different from closing on a single family rental. There's just a lot more check boxes under each and every line, right? Under each and every category. Um, it's not a whole lot different than multifamily, right? Closing an apartment community. Your diligence is going to be much more extensive. Your, the lending process may be more extensive, mm -hmm. but overall it's, it's the same general process. So what are some of the key things we look for? Um, some of the key things that we look for today, ideally we want to see a 30 licensed bed plus community a community that has a minimum 30 licensed beds. Mm -hmm. Ideally, we like to see each building, each facility have at least 25 mm -hmm. beds in it. When you get much lower than that, it's a lot harder to find that economies of scale, mm -hmm. right? Let's say that we have a 50 bed community. And in the first instance, we have two buildings side by side and they're each 25 beds. Or actually they could be two buildings 10 minutes apart or 20 minutes apart and they each have 25 licensed beds in each building. In each building, whether they're 20 minutes apart or right next door to each other, each building needs a commercial kitchen. Mm -hmm. They need cooks, they need activities directors, they need nurses, they should have nurses, I should say. They need a certain amount of caregivers. But the more beds you get under one roof, like the more economies of scale you have, right? For example, if instead of those two 25 bed buildings, we had 10, or sorry, let's say five, 10 bed buildings. Each one of those buildings still needs a cook, an activities director, a nurse, a certain amount of caregivers. You may be able to get away with floating, but you like, you don't realize it because we've tried. Having buildings right next door to each other doesn't necessarily mean that you can, that you can share staff, right? Especially mm -hmm. in Wisconsin. Let's take Wisconsin, for example. They get some pretty inclement weather in Wisconsin. And if it's negative 10 degrees out, you think people are going to want to be bouncing back and forth from building to building all day. Our cook's going to want to cook here 
and then deliver food back over here. Like that there's, it's just not best practice. It's not good practice. So each building still needs its own kitchen, still needs its own cook. You, you lose a lot of scale when you've got these smaller buildings, which is okay for the way certain, some people may operate. But for us, we're, we're going for scale and scalability. And so we target higher unit counts, higher bed counts. Let's see, what else do we target? You know, ultimately we found the spot that's about a win-win and I'm not a huge advocate of relying on an entry cap rate when, you know, underwriting or really taking that metric into any form of significant consideration in our underwriting. But we have found a trend over most of our acquisitions that in the senior living space, like somewhere in that 10 and a half to 12 cap range is, is usually where we acquire. That's usually where it makes sense for us. And it's still reasonable for the seller. Um, so we know right off the bat, that's probably about the range that we're going to fall in when we're ready to acquire a facility. That's obviously a much different cap rate than folks would be in, uh, used to in, in the multifamily space. But again, we're just talking about a different asset class in there you know, probably an eight and a half to 10, 10 and a half cap rate is, is average. So we're higher than that. So we're pretty, we're pretty conservative on our entries and we're, we're just more conservative across the board. Sorry. I feel like I'm rambling a little bit. I hope that answered your question, Emily. This is good. Uh, I do want to touch back to the point that you mentioned earlier because people, the culture is the key. So when you are looking for a facility, if, the facility is actually currently operated badly. Like how important it is as a as it's a factor for you to make an investment on a like on a facility. That's a really good question. And that's one of the most difficult things. Like you can't underwrite the culture no. of a, of the staff at a community. All right. It's hard, very, very difficult to even perform diligence on the staff or the culture. And we can ask for a staff roster where we'll get everybody's credentials, all their experience, all their qualifications, all their hourly rates or salaries or employment agreements, all their reviews, if there are any supervisory management performance reviews. But what we found is that this industry is still largely fractured, very mom and pop. And a lot of that doesn't exist. I mean, it's, if you've ever underwritten a true unsophisticated mom and pop operation. It's very difficult because they don't have real financials. <laughs> you get bits and pieces, you get a homemade rent roll on a word doc kind of thing. And it's, it's very hard to put all the pieces together. And that's a lot of the times what we're dealing with. When you get into the bigger spaces and bigger facilities, you'd be surprised there are still a lot of semi sophisticated mom and pops and fractured ownership owning and operating these, these facilities, oftentimes doing a suboptimal job. So one of the things that really sticks out when we started getting out into the market and walking properties, when we're really looking at senior living is getting behind some of these closed doors and doing diligence. There's the unfortunate reality is that there's a lot of really alarming things going on at, at these homes and facilities. And you know, that kind of, I know I'm getting a little off track here, but it kind of comes back to our mission of wanting even more so to acquire some of these facilities so that we can make them better ultimately for the residents and for the staff. It's not a great environment for the staff either. So you do the best you can to answer your question, Emily. You go in, a, a lot of sellers are also very, staffing is so difficult today. In a post-COVID world, healthcare, staffing, and I, I mean, there's just such an employment, a shortage of employment and people that want to work in this industry, it is very difficult. And, you know, wages are on the rise pretty sharply. A lot of other operating expenses in the healthcare field are on the rise, you know, pretty significantly. And the number of people that want to show up to work are at an all time low in the space. So it's really difficult and you need a really strong culture to attract the right people. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do if we're in diligence, we actually are in diligence right now. Next week, we're going to, to walk a facility. So I'll walk through what we'll do. Just more on, on the staffing side of things. 
So we've got all, all the due diligence docs that you can ask for, all the information on all the staff. But again, that doesn't tell you much. So I like to go and we'll, we'll watch and we'll listen. Watch the staff, see what they're doing, ask some questions. Uh, what would you do? Would you move your mom in here? Would you move your grandma in here? Uh, would, you, would you consider living here when you're of age? Uh, some of those types of things. Thanks. It's very telling when somebody would not move their own mother or grandmother into a home because they're not excited about the way it's being run. A lot of things. Sometimes we'll, we'll just ask about other staff. Like, hey, how do you work? like working with the other staff here? How's, how's the manager? How's, how's this? How's that? So just asking discreet but thoughtful questions and just really watching the way people, watching the way people react. Sometimes what we'll do is if we're in, in a unit, I'll pull one of the, the nurse call cords and just see how long it takes somebody to respond. I understand that there's a lot going on at times and there's not always an immediate response and that's okay. But if it's minutes and minutes and minutes, if it's five, 10, 15 minutes, that's, that's a problem. That's a very big problem. The food is a big one. <laughs> you mm -hmm. go take a peek in the kitchen, go look at what kind of food they're eating, look at what's in the stocked in the pantries and the fridges and the freezers. Uh, what kind of leftovers do they have? You know, are you there while they're serving a meal for a plate? What kind of activities are they running? Now, these are all things that can hint at a healthy or unhealthy operations in a culture. Mm -hmm. uh, I like, we'll always sit down with who, who's heading the ship, who's steering the ship at this, at this building, at this community. And we'll have a good couple chats with them throughout diligence. And ultimately you want to figure out, is that the right person at the helm of the ship? And are there a bunch of people that need to be replaced? Because you can't change a culture. We have tried and tried and tried. I mean, maybe I shouldn't say you can't. Maybe I should say we haven't figured out how to change a culture, mm -hmm. do a 180 with a culture with this, keeping all the same people in place. Mm -hmm. We haven't figured that out yet. So we're not here to go in and, and displace people from their jobs and turn them. But if that's the only way for us to get from A to B and create a healthier, more pleasant, more exciting, more exhilarating and uh, engaging, compassionate environment for seniors in their homes, that's what we're going to do. So ultimately what the question you're answering is how many people do, are we going to need to turn out of here? Do we need to turn everybody out or is it just this one person at the helm or is it nobody? Is everything going really well? And you know, there's nothing you can do until you close, but you can just be ready for and have a plan in place for what you're going to need to do day one. I love it. So I know that you have a very successful operator on the team, but then you also have 10 assisted living and memory care facilities. So do you hire, say, a house manager or administrator for each facility? And this person, even though you have someone who is really good at the helm, but you still need someone for each facility, how do you go and hire about this kind of personnel? Yeah, that's a really good question. So it, it depends. Uh, it doesn't need to be necessarily one person per building. It may be, let's say there's three buildings that are side by side. Well, you might have one nurse manager across those three buildings who mm -hmm. is also the administrator, right? So in typical nomenclature for in the space is executive director. And that implies a more administrative type of manager which we don't adhere to that is more classical train of thought in this in the assisted living and senior care space we'll hire what we call a nurse manager which is basically an executive director except for they're a registered nurse they're mm -hmm. they've got clinical experience they've got nurse management uh, experience and that clinical expertise and experience bring a much needed experience to the table where they've they've got so much more of that, you know, clinical, because that's really what we're offering here is it's a care business, mm -hmm. right? And if you don't have the schooling and the education on how to provide that clinical care for folks, you know, you're just, you're, I don't want to say just a manager, but you know, more or less like an administrative style manager. We, we want that clinical care style management approach. So we've constructed a nurse led system where we will have a, a nurse at the helm of uh, a portfolio of communities, right? So really kind of like a regional nurse manager and we have one two three of well 
four of those, and then the, the operations director, which is the person who I was talking about and referencing earlier in our conversation. Okay, great, thank you. And how do you finance your deals? Ooh, questions. Oh. Again, it all depends. It, just, it depends on the size of the deal, the size of the loan that you are seeking. It depends on the status of the deal. Is it is it in high level of distress? Is it largely stabilized? There's a lot of different options we have. We've done everything from local and regional lenders all the way up to HUD acquisitions. Excuse me. HUD will lend an, on senior living and assisted living facilities. It's much longer lengthier and very intensive process to get into HUD, but it is extremely attractive debt when you are when you are in HUD. In some cases, it takes so long to get in into a HUD loan, to originate a HUD loan, that you'll have a bridge, right? Mm -hmm. You may need a bridge debt to get through the first 12, 24 months, because it may take eight to 12 months to get into that HUD debt. So that's pretty common if we find a larger facility that is mostly stabilized, that's the route that we would love to go. But again, sometimes we'll, it's a lot like multifamily where it just depends on, it depends on the asset and what's going on. It depends on the business plan and what your path forward is. So ideally we love to land at, land in HUD because that means you've got a stabilized asset. You've got really long-term uh, low rate debt, no maturity, well, your maturity risk is 35 years down the road. Mm -hmm. So how does it compare to SBA loans? I think SBA is very popular loan options for people who want to acquire these kind of facilities. And SBA also takes a while to close. And yes. so what are the pros and cons if we compare to compare SBA loan with HUD or some other loan options? I know SBA, we've purchased several facilities out from under SBA loans. So these sellers had originated an SBA loan. I've never originated an SBA loan personally. So I, I don't know that I can speak very well to the pros and cons of an SBA loan versus any other type of loan. From my understanding, it is, you know, it's another, another government backed program. So it's long, it's cumbersome. There's a ton of hoops to jump through. Also my understanding, I don't believe SBA works well in a complex partnership structure. Uh, I think SBA is most common with like a single or maybe joint ownership structure. HUD is a more forgiving and understanding on the larger partnership structure. The SBA, in my understanding, also has a cap on total proceeds that you can originate from the SBA. But again, take that with a grain of salt because I'm, I'm certainly no SBA expert and I've not originated an SBA loan. Thank you. And you mentioned that you will leverage local or regional lenders. So my question is, when leveraging other people's money, how do you mitigate the potential risks? Oh, excellent question. There are three main things that we ensure that are in place for every deal in order to mitigate most of the risk. Really for any commercial real estate investment, these are applicable. Number one, we make is, is cash flow. Cash flow day one, cash flow positive day one, or we have an extremely clear short term line of sight to cash flow inside of six months, let's say. So near term cash flow to an extremely high degree of confidence. Number one. Number two is maturity risk. We are not interested in being in short-term loans with without a cap on, mm -hmm. on interest. I did just say that we'll enter a short-term bridge loan to, <laughs> to get into HUD. So we'll make sure that we've got a plan B and C as far as exit strategies if for some reason HUD doesn't go through. Uh, so we underwrite more stringently than HUD standards the deal before we even get into a bridge loan. So we know we have a lot of buffer with this deal before we would be unable to refine to HUD. Mm -hmm. We make sure that the term of the bridge is two to three times as long as our expected time frame to get into HUD. So if, if I say, hey, it's going to be six to 12 months before we can refine to HUD, we're going to make sure that we've got 
at least 24, if not 36 month term on that bridge. And we're also pretty conservative on the caps that we'll put in place. So putting the right debt in place, making sure that we don't have short-term maturity risk or we're extremely conservatively mitigating that risk and we don't have any open-ended interest floating rates out there. And then number three is going to be just cash reserves. So mm -hmm. you'll notice that all of these three things have in some way, shape or form to do with cash flow. You get in trouble when you, you run out of cash in mm -hmm. any of these opportunities. And so that's something that we're just not willing to allow to happen. So we'll raise upfront a very healthy reserve bucket. We'll have our estimated CapEx reserves, future CapEx reserves, we'll have our operating reserves. And on top of that, we'll have just like a reserve bucket, a rainy day fund that you ideally never touch and that will just go stick in a money market or high yield savings and let it earn something. But that'll be 12, I mean, we've gone up to 18 months principal and interest payments in, into reserves, at least 12. I don't, I'm not, I don't want to do anything less than 12. If the deal can't support 12 months of P&I payments and reserves, then we'll pass. We'd rather pass on a good deal than close on a bad deal. Thank you. How do you balance the need to generate a return on investment with the responsibility of providing quality care to your residents? Oh my goodness, you're on fire. These are some <laughs> questions. Well done. All right. So how do we balance the need of providing a return with quality care? The good news in this space, in my opinion, is that the two go hand in hand. It's definitely not one or the other. It's actually the opposite, in my opinion. I think too many people view it as one or the other. Like, ah, I need to costs and sacrifice care and quality of services to be able to pad the bottom line. And it's like, no, you're going about it way backwards. You're, you're racing to the bottom, and that's exactly where you're going to end up. The higher quality care that you provide in today's world, the fuller your resident pipeline will be, your incoming pipeline will be, the more referrals you will get because the stronger brand reputation you will have, there'll be more people willing to pay higher rates mm -hmm. to have that quality care. I mean, if you could pay, just pull some numbers out of hat, let's say that you could pay 5,000 bucks a month for your mom or your grandma to go stay at senior living home A and questionable quality, they don't have great activities, foods, you don't want to eat it. Or you can pay 6,500 bucks for them to go stay at, or 7,000 bucks for them to go stay at senior living home B, who had tremendous nurses, smiling faces every time you walk in, clean facilities, no odors, no smells. They had activities, they had fantastic food. That like it would it just not a question, right? You'd find a way, figure out a way to make it happen, one way or the other. It's I think that's where a lot of people's heads are. So. I don't think that there really is much of a balance. I think it's one or the other. You have both and you'll get both or you're sacrificing one and ultimately you're going to sacrifice both. I love this. Thank you. And we probably touched on this a little bit, but I would like to really make it clear to our audience and maybe you can also summarize it because you, you actually had a very successful track record in multifamily real estate. And can you share... The key lessons that you learned from this investment that you have applied to senior living. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really the starting it with the foundation of any real estate investing experience. And I tell this to people all the time. Is somebody will say, like, ah, oh, you know, I just have I just have a couple single family rentals. I'm like, you don't just have a couple single family rentals. You have a tremendous foundation of experience that most people don't have that will get you closer to the next step and the next step and the next step. I mean, it's all just, it's a path to a destination or maybe it's an endless journey, which is more of what I feel like mine is. But every step you take is, is an important step as long as you're moving in the right direction. You need to know where you're going generally so you can be trending down a path in the right direction. But as long as you're making continuous progress, I mean, baby steps that that's okay. You're making progress. You're getting there, right? You don't have to take leaps and bounds if you're not ready to take leaps and bounds. Just keep moving. Just don't stop moving. 
is what I tell people. So any experience in the real estate investing space is, is really good because the general outline of how you find any of these deals and make any of these deals happen is, is all the same. You mm -hmm. need to figure out what you're buying, get deal flow. You need to know how to analyze those opportunities and, and assess their feasibility. You need to generate a business plan and execute. You need to perform due diligence, you need to close, and then you need to go execute your business plan. And that's the same for a single family rental, although you know there are gonna be much fewer steps along the way, it's gonna be a much easier process, but the same general outline. And then you can step up into maybe small multi, multifamily, multifamily syndications, or other types of commercial real estate syndications and away you go. So all the foundations, whether it's underwriting, whether it's performing diligence, whether it's working with lenders, those foundations are all very similar. The, the nuance becomes different and you need to take the time to understand and educate yourself on the specific nuance of whatever asset class you are endeavoring toward. And I found that that's most easily done by finding somebody who's already successful and experienced in that space and you know just offering to do whatever you can for them for free to learn and that's i mean that's the highest roi that you can obtain in my opinion is just that knowledge and education thank you okay uh my final two questions for you what's your favorite book oh my lord that's wow that's really tough I'm going to, I'm not going to think about this too hard and I'm just going to go with what came right off the cuff of the sleeve when you asked that. <clears throat> There's a book by Bob Berg called The Go-Giver. Have you heard of that? Yes, yes, I know. Go-Giver is, it's short, it's excellent, and it really just kind of affirmed, I think, something that I've always felt. And it did a very good job of putting that into words, which is operate with a service first mentality. Go give give more, give first, give often. Yeah, I think that's just such a powerful life message. Thank you. And how can our audiences get in touch with me? The easiest way to get in touch with me is email. You can reach me at lauren, L-O-R-E-N dot Jacobs at arrows capital group dot com. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm on X formerly Twitter. I'm not super active in the social spaces. I will respond to a message at some point. Uh, email is, is the best. So email is, is going to be the easiest way to get a hold of me. You can all, also check us out at arrowscapitalgroup.com uh, and learn more about what we're doing. So Thank you. Thank you, Lauren, to share with us your knowledge and your expertise. Thank you. I appreciate Thank you today. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate those like excellent, thoughtful questions re really made me think. So I yeah, really appreciate the opportunity to be here, Emily. I appreciate everything you're doing. I think this is really, really exciting. I, I enjoy listening to your podcasts and, and I'm just very privileged to be here. So thank you so much. Thank you.